Okay, so when a judgment is entered, and we're talking small claims, we're going to talk jurisdiction in a minute, but when a judgment is entered, the first thing that comes up is a small claims defendant disclosure form. So what that means is I'm going to go to court, I'm going to tell the judge, Ivanhoe's me money, the judge gives me a, a judgment, and the judge will tell Ivanhoe when he's in court, and says, Mr. Ivanhoe, the first thing you have to do is you have to fill out a small claims defendant information form. What that is, is gonna, it's, it's sort of like a deposition in writing. It's like interrogatories, where we're going to ask Mr. Ivanhoe, where do you live? Do you own any real estate? Where do you bank? All that sort of stuff. Now, I got some wor words for you about this, just from my experience. Only the people that don't have anything fill that form out voluntarily. Thank you for getting that. I appreciate it. That was really funny. <laughs> Only the people that don't have anything fill it out. Ivanhoe, if you had a judgment entered against you, would you sit down, fill out a form, and tell them where all your bank accounts are? No! Nobody's going to do that. So in my years of doing this, I've only seen one. One of these forms filled out. You have a copy in your work. Only one time did I see it filled out, and it was a guy that had nothing. So I'm making my conclusion based on that. But it's, it's pretty truthful. So the defendant is not going to fill out the form. Ivanhoe refuses. He's supposed to do it within 60 days. And I go to Ivanhoe. I say, listen, I, I try to reach him. The judge, I go tell the judge, judge, I tell the judge, I make a motion to speak to the judge, I speak to the judge, judge, Mr. Ivanhoe has not filled out his form for the 90 days or whatever he's supposed to do it in. What can I do next? Because the judge will help me. In small court, the judge will help you. They'll say, he'll say, well, the first thing we're going to do is let's try to set him for a deposition. He'll come in front of me and we'll talk to Mr. Ivanhoe about his assets. That's what the judge is going to do. That's what they're going to help you. So we, def we do a defendant subpoena. And whether or not he comes or not is not going to be the issue of what we're talking about next. But that's the next step. Defendant form, defendant subpoena. We as, we're not lawyers. I don't know, is there any lawyer out here in here? No? Okay. We're not lawyers, so we can't issue subpoenas. We have to go to the court, ask the judge to do it, and they'll set a, a, a deposition down, and they will, they're the ones that are going to have to sign the subpoena. Next thing is garnishments. Okay, garnishment. Uh, a garnishment is when we ask somebody that owes Ivanhoe money, poor Ivanhoe, man, I'm just picking up you, that owes Ivanhoe money to hold it and give it to us. So normally what we garnish, I garnish the most, I garnish bank accounts. I like to garnish bank accounts. You can garnish wages. A bank account is what's called a one-time writ, a bank garnishment, because the writ is served on the bank. Whatever money is in the bank, the minute that thing gets served, it's like you take a picture of it, and that's how much the bank is going to hold. They're not going to give it to you just because you asked for it or you filed a writ. That's all going to take some time through the courts. But they'll hold the money there, and they have to hold up to three times the amount. So if you go after somebody for five grand, your body of your writ says five grand, they're going to hold 15 if they have it. Ivanhoe's going to be upset, but that's a whole other story. We'll talk about that when we get into dealing with defendants. That's my bank garnishment. A bank garnishment is a one-time writ. I like bank garnishments the most because, as you're going to see in Florida Statute 222, which you have a copy of, those are exemptions. There are more exemptions for a defendant to a wage garnishment than there are to a bank garnishment. So that's why I like bank garnishments, because they have less defenses. A wage garnishment is known as a continuing writ, because what the continuing writ is going to do, it's going to be served on Ivanhoe's employer, and it's going to demand, does Ivanhoe still work there? Yes. How much does he make? 500 a week. And it's going to demand that that employer now send 25% of his pay to me. So I'm going to get 125 bucks a month, or biweekly, whatever he gets paid, um, comes to me, 25%. But as you can imagine, there, is, there are a host of exemptions for, for wages. Okay, so it's, it's, there's a host of defenses against a wage garnishment. The most pre prevailing one would be head of household. 
If he's the head of his household, the only person that's working, he works with his back, you're not going to get a penny from a wage garnishment. Don't even bother. Which is why I've probably done two dozen wage garnishments in my entire life. Because they, the situation has to be so perfect in order to get collection, eh, not worth it. Or that take his car, but we'll talk about that later. So bank garnishments is a one-time writ. Wage garnishments is a continuing writ. Interestingly enough, one-time writ can be signed by the clerk. A wage garnishment writ, continuing writ, has to be signed by the judge. Just little nuances that the law makes exception for. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we've got our bank garnishment and our wage garnishment. When a bank writ gets served, the bank will hold all the money that they have. They'll hold safe deposit boxes. They'll hold everything, and they'll just wait for clarification from the judge. So whatever, a retirement account's not going to be held. Everything that's liquid in the bank will be held up to three times the amount of the writ, and the bank holds it and waits for the judge to make a final decision on how much of it gets paid to the plaintiff. Were you there last month when I spoke and I told you the way you find bank accounts is you send them, send them a check? Yeah, that, that, was the, that was probably one of the best ideas I ever came up with. But it doesn't work anymore. I, I can't send checks anymore as often as I could. My success rate now is going to be about 20% versus 70%. Because people they take pictures of their checks and the checks don't get canceled. and it, There's no paperwork anymore after somebody deposits a check. So it's not going to work as effectively. So can I monitor accounts anywhere? I don't know. I don't think so. I think what you're going to end up doing is just serving the writ, hoping for the best, and you get what you get. Are you going home already? I oh, I was going to say, I'm thinking, gee whiz, that, this would be the earliest anybody left. <laughs> what? No, no, I wish it was that easy. The bank holds it separate and apart from everybody else, and they wait for the judge to issue an order that says, okay, now you can give $3,000 that's your holding to the plaintiff. So no, they, the bank doesn't do anything without the court's order. But they, pull it, but they pull it and hold it. They hold it off to the side where the defendant nor I could reach it. The plaintiff can't reach it. The defendant can't reach it either. Oh, by the way, all your checks bounce too. So I mean, <laughs> yeah. Sir? Um, with the writs on the bank, is it only on personal banks or can you do it on like somebody's business bank account? Or if the defendant is the business, then you can garnish the business bank account. Mm. So it has to be, the money has to be in the name of the defendant. And we're not going to go into husband and wife because that's a little more too detailed than we need today. But if the, if the account is tenants by the entirety of husband and wife, you cannot attach part of it. You cannot attach Ivanhoe's money because it's an account with his wife. It's tenants by the entireties. And we'll talk about that during a break or something. I don't even think I talked about that. Ma'am, yes, ma'am. And they shut me down. They shut me down. Yeah. But most people are not going to quit their jobs for that kind of money. The best thing to do with any kind of writ, bank or, or continuing, call the defendant and negotiate with him. If you're supposed to get 25% of his pay, listen, I won't take 25. If we can work this out, just give me 100 bucks a month. Because the more defenses he has, the more willing you should be to collect less. But if you collect something and start the cash flow coming, at least you can put the file off to the side. It produces every month, and you don't got to worry about paying lawyers. Mm. Sir? So you said the cash flow goes to you. Mm. But what about the person who put the, the, well, yeah, the plaintiff? Well, ultimately it goes to the plaintiff. But if I'm 50-50 with the plaintiff and I get 100 bucks a month, he gets 50. I got you. And i got to pay him myself. Okay. okay, there's one thing I want to talk about before we break, and I forgot what it was. You can levy on real estate, you can levy on autos, boats, airplanes, business assets, and other personal properties. Although every one of those writs are a little bit different. Now in your workbook, when you get a chance, you don't got to do it now, you'll see what the cost of some of those levies are. Now Orange County does not or did not provide me any information with regard to the cost of their writs. So I included one from Broward County from a couple years ago, I think maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, from when I was doing business in Broward. When you levy on an automobile, 
you have got to put up a levy fee, which is probably going to be about 1500 bucks. You've got to put up a cost deposit because the sheriff takes that automobile and delivers it to a tow company and they charge you tow storage. I don't know if any of you guys ever had your car towed yeah. to see what that charge is. They bang you good. That's some of the most valuable real estate in the world, the land that the tow company has because they charge so much money for it. And what's cool about that, well, uh, get into it, the, share, the, the tow company bids with the county every year for their tow business. Not only is it picking up wrecks from accidents and stuff like that, but it's, it's cherry work like this, storing levies. And they charge $125 a day. It's like, come on, man. And you've got to put up a couple days worth of storage when you, when you levy on an automobile. So, so that's the storage cost. So long story short, it's a little expensive to do an auto levy, but it's very successful. Your chances of success, success 90%. And when I say success, that means getting some money from that guy. Because I don't want to take his car and sell it, because in Florida he has a $5,000 exemption. So if I sell it for six, I don't even get my cost back. How many of you guys have ever gone to a sheriff's sale? Oh, besides you. OK. Sheriff sales, there's some value there. For real estate, they have sheriff sales for value. You want to pick up a car, it's for value. You get some, 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 some decent discounts because you're only bidding against you and Billy Bob. That's it. There's not many people at those sales. But the one thing you have to remember, and some of you might understand this term, you buy at the sheriff sale subject to any existing liens. But you don't have to pay them, huh? I like that. So I, I got Ivanhoe, I got his Porsche, or whatever that fancy-ass car he drives is. I got his car up on the tow truck. It goes to the sheriff. We auction it off. His payment is $2,000 a month, but I get to drive it as long as I want. I get to drive it until the lien holder wants to try, to try to take it from me. He's got to keep paying. If he doesn't pay, his car company is going to get mad, and they're going to say, okay, where's the car? We want to pick it up. And you'll say, Richard has it over at this house. Oh, okay. And I wake up one morning, and the car's gone. Okay, well, it was fun for a little while. <laughs> but it might have it cost me 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks to drive it around, and he's going to make all the payments, and the ding goes on his credit report, so it's fun. When you're younger, it's fun. I'm not going to do it now because I don't even like that car. It's cheaper than renting on a luxury car, right? It certainly is cheaper. Yeah, yeah. And it's fun. It's fun, especially if I got a bone to pick with Ivanhoe. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't do that anymore, though. OK, so real estate, you can levy on real estate. A lot, lot less expensive to levy on real estate. All you have to do is pay for a title policy for the sheriff so they make sure they know what they're doing. But again, you're doing a levy subject to the existing liens. Same with boats, airplanes, business assets, and other personal property. Although the caveat with personal property is the defendant has to willingly turn it over. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to spend too much time on boats, airplanes, and other business assets because if you can get your hands on them, the people will pay. And the way I say they're going to pay, which is the way most of my car, my auto garnishments go, uh, wage, uh, auto levies go, is we'll pick up Ivanhoe's car. The sheriff will be standing right next to the tow truck, and they'll call me, and they say, Mr. Meyer, we've got Ivanhoe's tr a car right here on the tow truck. I say, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to call them right now. Hang up. Call Ivanhoe. Ivanhoe, we've got your car back. And go look in the parking lot, and you can see it's on the back of a tow truck. And here's what we can do. You can, you can give me the money to satisfy my judgment, or I can take the car away. I'm the only person that has the power to stop the levy. Rich, I'm the only guy, just like you and you and you. You're going to be the only person that has the power to stop that truck from being taken his car away. And what does Ivanhoe want the most? Put the truck, put the car down and let me have it. <laughs> but I got to get some money out of you. If he owes me 10, okay, can you write me a check for 10? Okay, how about nine? How about eight? I need something. i got to pay these guys, and I'm going to take your car. Come on, I'm getting tired. And we'll settle on a number. I'll give you five, and I'll give you $1,000 a month for five months. Okay, that's great. That's what I'm going to do. But you know what I'd really like for, the, for my $5,000? This is the second best thing I ever thought of, is I want you to give me a secured place, either on the car or on some real estate you own. What does that mean? I want to be on your title as a lien holder, or I want to be on your real estate, and it's anything. I don't care if it's over encumbered. As a mortgage holder. OK, I'll do it. You darn right, you will. I'll take your car away. So what I just do, I turned unsecured money into secured money. 
You know anybody else that's ever done that? You probably don't. Unsecured, there was no asset tied to that money. Now it's secured tied to his house or to his car. Now what does that mean? That means I don't have to go through all the rigmarole with the sheriff to take that property away. I can go out there with, an, with a tow truck driver that has an investigator's license, go pick up this car, he owes me money. Vroom, done. And they pick it up and they take it away. So that's the difference between unsecured and secured debt. Secured debt, I have access to the asset. I can foreclose on his real estate. I don't care if it's upside down. I don't care. So the same thing goes for like the, the boat, the plane, the, all that. Yeah. First, yep. you got to go in with the sheriff. Sheriff is going to be my is going to be my man. But you got to locate the, the 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 thing first, right? Obviously, you have to locate the asset. So I know there's a place of public record where they list all boat owners or boats or something and cars and planes. Cars, part cars, a little more difficult. But if you have any of the three. Um, Skip trace programs, they'll give you information about automobiles. They probably do boats too, and airplanes. I've never done a boat or an airplane. So the, more, the, the larger the asset, the more likely the guy's going to roll over and say, okay, I'll do it. They'll acquiesce because they don't want to lose their stuff. Can't say that I blame them.